Hi, welcome to WetPixel Live. I'm Alex Mustard, Associate Editor of WetPixel, standing in for Adam Hanlon. The lucky so-and-so's off diving this week, so I get to host a few of these. And I want to continue chatting about photogrammetry. And to help me with that, I've invited along Simon Brown, known on the WetPixel forums as Deco Snapper. Good to see you, Simon. Hi, Alex. Good to see you. Um, and I want, in this episode, to really crack on and talk about the equipment that you need to get into this. I think there'll be a lot of people watching this who've been fascinated seeing the pictures you've shown and want to know whether the gear they've currently got um, is actually enough for them to start getting into this. So what gear do you use? What gear would you recommend for underwater photogrammetry? Well, the, the gear that you, if you're into underwater photography, you've almost certainly got the kit that you need to create 3D models. It's as simple as that. Um, the kind of equipment always has a balance as to how much detail do you want in the model versus uh, how much long, how many, how much time do you want to process it. But basically, if you're shooting with a DSLR or a GoPro and everything in between, you can get a result. Now, with the GoPros, they've got their own limitations, got their own issues sometimes, um, but there's nothing unsurmountable. Um, would you uh, use it in video mode or stills mode on a GoPro? Yeah, typically video because you know, you can extract um, uh, individual frames from video and, and then use that to reconstruct the model. So you can shoot video uh, with video lighting. And as long as you're fairly smooth and consistent and no jerking and it's nice steady panning, you can extract the frames and then reconstruct a, a model from it. There are s some advantages that if, if you – if you're working with video, if you think that you've missed somewhere and you've blurred it a little bit, if you go forward 10 frames or back 10 frames, you can usually find a frame that's, that's worked. So you can recover slightly more. Um, I personally work with strobes and a DSLR mm. primarily because I can work faster. Um, I set the camera up, I set what I want it to shoot, and then I'm shooting a frame every half to every second, sometimes a bit more, a bit less. With the strobes, you get a, such a, an intense burst of light. It freezes the image. You get a nice sharp image. You yeah, know you, you don't have detail the sharpness it, that the software must it, like. It, it loves it. Yeah. yeah. So, so for the detail, for speed, uh, and certainly for accuracy of alignment as well, I use the DSLR. Okay. And then, what lenses are, are best for this? Um, uh, wide angle, absolutely wide angle. Don't even think about uh, trying to, you know, shoot with a large subject with macro lenses. Um, but what about fish eyes? You know, is the distortion... Yeah, fish eye. No, fish eyes, no problem. I work with a 16mm fish eye all the time. Uh, it's my go-to choice. Uh, it's probably a 20-year-old lens now, but it still mm. delivers a fantastically sharp result, and it's that sharpness that the photogrammetry really loves. And, and, and does the software defish it before it tries to put them together how does it do no, no 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 it's all done in camera calibration so oh, okay. with a fisher you've got very very extreme distortion um but the camera uh, um writes the information about the lens to the metadata of the image and when you read it into metashape it then understands that it's a 16 mil fisheye you set the calibration to be a fisheye and it's got a set of pre-configured parameters that say okay i understand the lens i understand the physics Crucially, I understand how the light has entered that lens and landed on that pixel, on the sensor. And from that, you can reconstruct the scene. Um, a lot of the cameras these days have you know, ridiculously high resolutions. And I guess if you were getting into this and you, you happen to own a very high resolution camera, you might want to set the camera to shoot a lower resolution file for those dives. Oh, oh, I'd be hesitant ever to downgrade well, a camera. Got a 45 megapixel camera, maybe setting it back to 20 megapixel might make things a bit more manageable if you're going to take a tap. Because also you're going to create a huge amount of, you know, you're going to fill memory cards, fill computers up if you start doing thousands of pictures. Yeah, you should see the uh, you should see my uh, stack of network archive <laughs> storage that I've got for my data. It's got 20 terabytes in it now, oh, and it's still it's you still growing. Adam jealous. He loves to have the most cameras and the most everything. So uh, well, uh, it's a curse. Be careful because mm. you've got to back it up as well. Um, <laughs> so with, with um, I mean, if somebody said to me, here's a 45 megapixel camera, do you want to do you want to downgrade it? I'd say, no, I want every bit of detail mm -hmm. in that because I can downgrade it after I've shot the image mm -hmm. and I can downgrade it during processing. So I can say, give me all the 45 megapixels I can. In post-processing, I can reduce the size of the JPEG if I need to. And then when I'm in the meta shape itself, I can say, look, 
I know there's billions of points in this. Just find me 40,000, and then the software will work uh, faster to produce. Um, you're always working with like um, – it's like a, a constant – friction between how much detail do i want versus how much time do i want to take to process it mm -hmm. versus how much can anyone actually look at i've processed things that i can't even work on my screen because the level of detail is too high on my older laptop and if you put something like that on sketchfab nobody's going to look at it because it mm -hmm. just takes too long to load you know mm -hmm. and so if you work always when you're working with this aim think about what the end result is and who's going to look at it and that way you can always start Start with lots and downgrade it through the steps. I'm also interested in how you deal with the fact that you're taking so many images on a dive, both in terms of diving equipment and the fact that you probably want to, you know, maximize bottom time and, and, and have time to, to cover detail in one sweep. But at the same time, also, particularly with strobes, how you make them, you know, how the choices you need to make about the equipment to be able to take so many pictures. Okay, I'm going to speak from experience now and just mm. put a reminder in here that this is task loading. Mm. This is a focus. This is an attention. You will be working, shooting hundreds or thousands of images, and you want them to overlap. So you're thinking about the overlap. You're thinking about your process. You're thinking about how you swim through a subject. You do need to stop, stop and, and realize that things can go wrong, and you need to keep an eye on your air and all the other things that you need to manage a dive successfully, like decompression mm -hmm. stops. Um, with strobes, uh, they tend to be, on the longer jobs, The that's the first battery that dies. If I'm shooting two, maybe 3,000 images on a dive, which is not unusual, then the strobe will start to take longer to recycle, and you think, yeah, okay, it's probably time I'm done now because I can't actually produce any more images yeah. um, uh, reliably and quickly. So, so I actually think some of the new modifications like um, Retro have made this extendable battery pack to give their strobes mm -hmm. more life. Some of those modifications might be really interesting. It does also make me think, though, that cameras that use pop-up flashes and have quite a big power drain on the camera probably mm -hmm. wouldn't be good camera bodies for photogrammetry. Um, I would, yeah, that's going to be a problem. If they're draining and recycling the internal flash, then the internal camera battery is going to be struggling yeah. as well. And some of the yeah. mirrorless cameras also have quite small batteries and because they're powering up a bigger amount. They last a, a dive or two very happily for normal photography, but this is another level in terms of number of frames. So those are important yeah, you, to you need choosing gear. Yeah, you need hundreds or thousands of frames, mm. really, to reconstruct something of any mm. decent size. Even on a small site, I'll do five to 800 images and not even think about it. Mm. Whereas, you know, if I was shooting for just 2D images, You'd find a subject to work it for 20 or 40 frames maybe and then move on to another one and do 20 or 40. It's a different level, different but scale. When you're getting into this and you're trying to learn the techniques, obviously you can, you can practice on land, but how do you get a feel for how many pictures to take of a subject, how to manage the overlapping and, and that sort of thing? What advice have you got there? I would start by practicing on topside. Mm. Mistakes topside can be rectified. You can learn quickly. The software will actually show you where... Um, there's weakness in the model. So it will highlight in red or, or light colors where the points are that it's found and are not strong enough. So you can think, well, why aren't, why doesn't that particular area have so many, so many, so much detail? And generally you look at it and think, well, actually, if I'd have taken instead of three pictures there, if I'd have taken five with a, with a less gap between them, you get more overlap, you get more detail. So you so also practice. don't want to take 10 because it's. No, you don't. Yeah, because then it slows down processing time, uh, particularly with the dense cloud, um, which is one of the steps in the processing. It can take, um, if you've got a lot of a consistent overlap with very little, um, almost, you know, images on top of each other, then it slows right down. Mm. So it becomes a problem. So practice topside, aim for anywhere between 70 and 80% overlap. Uh, remember, you have to overlap in the X and the Y. So... Um, in both and directions vertically. Yeah, and vertically as well yeah so and if you're transitioning something like a corner uh, or an edge then you should ideally shoot a frame every 10 15 degrees so you're getting plenty of overlap as you transition around things and that so, preserves detail so to put you on the spot say i i put a fisheye lens on my slr and i go out the front of my house and i want to photogrammetrically scan my car 
roughly oh. how many sort of pictures would I want to take? Uh, don't do your car. That's the first thing. It's oh. covered in reflections. And oh, okay. It's, it, it's got no texture. Wait, um, you don't know how rusty it is. Maybe it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what. If you want to scan a car, do a dirty car. They okay. will scan. Okay, um, but, but roughly would... how many pictures do you need to scan your rusty, well, dirty car? Yeah, before we go too far, be careful with that as well. Subject selection top side. Avoid anything that's mirrored, shiny, highly reflective. It will cause uh, confusion to the software. I have, for my police work, been able to scan cars, and there is a whole technique devoted to it. But for a starter, find something else. Okay, uh, I will do. Like a, like a bench or a, yeah. a shed, something with texture, something with lots of you know rich features. So a car, uh, well, let's go back to, say, um, think of a subject like a let's say a garden bench you know a typical garden bench two people yeah. it's quite complex you've got a lot of detail straight away you're going to think well do i need the arms to be fully detailed underside and top um if you just want a nice shape that's representative 50 frames 100 okay. frames maybe 200 but then when you start to find the gaps uh in the model you might think well actually i need i need 30 frames just to go around the arm and uh, there's two arms, so there's another 60 frames. So, yeah. If someone's interested in that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I guess the big thing that most of us who want to get into this won't have at the moment is is the, the software and the computing power to start getting into this. So, I think the final thing I wanted to ask you about really was what's the, what's the software to look at buying? Are there any yep. free ones for just trying it? And kind of yep. what type of computer do you need to run it all? All right, declare, declaration of interest here. I'm the reseller, UK reseller for MetaShape. Okay, uh, no, that's fine. MetaShape is a, is a good product. I've worked with it now for five or six years. Um, there are others on the market. I've worked with two of them. Um, for underwater work, for some reason, MetaShape's proved popular. Um, I, I'm not certain why, but I started using it five or six years ago. And there are more MetaShape questions specific to underwater than any others in the forums and on the Facebook groups. So um, Metashape is available in two two levels of, of software. There's the standard edition, which most people use, which allows you to create a 3D model. But then there's also the professional edition, which allows things like GPS, scaling, referencing. You can output the ortho photos. It's, all, it, it, it's really my go-to tool uh, for, for this kind of level of work that I do. Hardware-wise, uh, again, it all comes back to what level of detail do you need if you want a nice shape and you've got maybe i don't know a couple of hundred images um, you can process that on most hardware most normal. if you want a most normal hardware you know, if you've got a laptop macbook macbook pro you can process it um, if you process it on the lower settings because each stage that we go through you can you can wind down the settings you can wind down the number of points it finds you can wind down the level of detail in the mesh. All of these help um, with with fitting within the resources. So the other thing that you've got available to you is patience. And it's always a, a trade-off between how much you're willing to spend on your hardware versus how long do you want to wait to process it. Now, <laughs> I don't want to wait any time, so I've spent quite a lot of money on a decent uh, desktop that is dedicated now to processing 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 images in a reasonable amount of time because I don't want to wait. Mm. Uh, if you want to take this more seriously, then you would be to looking at at least 32 meg of RAM in a laptop plus a graphics card. Graphics card does really help processing at time. And then as many chips and many cores as you can logically justify. And also, uh, just to remember, the hard drive, uh, SSD, I would recommend, and then don't forget, all of this needs to be packed up somewhere as well, preferably off-site. So um, you, you start to have a, a sort of treadmill that you step onto with hardware. Um, and you're always finding limits and you're always thinking, how much do I need to solve this by? Do I need to solve it? No, I can live without that level of detail. Um, if you hit buffers, you can go into Amazon Web Services and other cloud services. And they've got dedicated hardware that's got graphics cards that you can rent by the hour. I use that on the physical to get it done. Uh, it still so, took 64 days of, of processing to, to get it finished. Wow. But, yeah. but um, And that was with parallel processing as well. So I had my, my home computer working on some certain chunks and then um, the, the cloud processing service running on others as well. Um, 
So gear-wise, I would say if you've got a DSLR, that's great. Low noise sensors are very good. I recommend mechanical shutters are preferred over what's called rolling shutters like the GoPro because they can introduce distortion. Uh, Wide-angle lenses for large subjects. Fisheye is a good go-to. Um, strobes, I find, work fast, allow me to work faster than video lights, but video lights are fine too. If you can expose uh, and, and get a technically correct single image underwater with your current camera, then you can just scale it up and shoot a hundred or a thousand of them. Make sure they overlap. It's job done. No, really, 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 really fascinating. Us, thanks very much. Um, tell us again where we can see more of your pictures because I think you know all this chat makes me want to see more of these shots. Sure. So uh, my website is is deep3d.co.uk. Uh, and that's got a lot of my work on there. And it's also got a tips, tricks, and news section that you can browse through by subject. Uh, and then the Sketchfab as well. My work is on Sketchfab if you look for the user Deep3D. There's a couple of hundred models there, including some collections that are devoted to things like physical and geo GPS referenced or whatever. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that you can pick through. Thanks very much, Simon. So just remains for me to say thank you very much for watching. I'd like to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Critters at Lembe. And um, if you enjoyed that video, please give us a like. Um, and if you're new here, please consider subscribing to Wet Pixel Live so that you don't miss any of these videos in the future. Thanks very much for watching. See you again next time.